thank you all for attending this panel. Uh, I want to lay out the context for this. Right now, there are more Americans, 65 and over, than we've ever had in our history. By 2050, there will be 80 million people in America over the age of 65. That will make up nearly a quarter of our population. All over the world, populations are, we're, we're seeing that same trend. People are staying in cities. New York City's Department of Aging, other cities have Department of Aging, look that try to examine what, how can we accommodate this demographic shift. There's so much attention in cities paid on millennials uh, and what they can contribute. And we really have to rethink how we are going to accommodate all of these older people living in our cities. Now, cities are not necessarily super amenable to older people. Uh, it's not necessarily super easy to navigate. We can talk about that a little. There are all kinds of reasons people are staying, though. I think the growth of the sharing economy is a big contributor here because, one, you can extend your income as an Uber driver. You can really combat social, social isolation if you're having someone stay in your house in Airbnb. Uh, so there, is all of the, there are all of these things to really consider. And I want to talk to you guys about, one, there is a real, with baby boomers, there's a real vanity barrier, maybe, to some of the stuff we might do because baby boomers notoriously uh, don't like to see them, consider themselves as old. And so what can we do both in terms of how we think about buildings, how we think about residential space? I'm always amazed that, you know, developers 10, 15 years ago, New York City, Everybody was building buildings with playrooms, art rooms for kids. There's a real opportunity, I think, here. You know, let's have beautiful apartment buildings with massage therapy and um, MRI machines. And, but, and I, don't know, I don't know if that's happening, but how can we both think about buildings and really the larger picture of constructing neighborhoods and whole cities? First, we have to change how we think about ourselves. That's job one. So. I'm 62, which means I count as an older adult. The stats that you gave count me as an older adult. I'm feeling fairly hale, fairly hearty, <laughs> and fairly eager to keep working. What's true is that there are more older adults, and what it means to be an older adult is changing. So chronological age, as we once knew it, um, actually shifts through time. Doesn't mean the city doesn't need to accommodate people at all stages of being old. But the first thing we need to stop doing is conceptualizing oldness as decrepitness and reclaim oldness as experience, as wisdom, as knowing how to do stuff, as being workers, as being teachers, as being activists. As a book I'm obsessed with reading right now puts it, um, Mindy Fuller Love's Urban Alchemy, read it if you haven't. Um, Cantel, who's an urbanist in there, says, you know, us old people, we have a responsibility. We saw all the exclusion. It's our responsibility to fight it. I would say, just a fast question, how many people here have gotten mailings from AARP and were shocked? <laughs> I continue to be shocked. I'm also 62, just by But 60 is the new 15, as we well Well, so. that's right. That's right. 80 is the new 40. Um, the one thing that you find that we found as architects and designers is that you know when people get their kids out of the house and they want to downsize, they want to start over again. They put off a lot of stuff. And I think they're viewing cities, if they leave the suburbs, as a place to do all the stuff that they put off doing because they've been working hard and paying for college and taking care of their kids, and they want new beginnings. I used to live in Washington, D.C., and when they started redeveloping uh, parts of the city east of 14th Street, if you know Washington, they started building all these loft apartments that they thought were going to be snapped up by millennials, mm -hmm. and they were mostly snapped up by baby boomers who were leaving Bethesda and Chevy Chase. They wanted to live in a loft apartment. They dumped all their old furniture. They got hip, you know, they went to design within reach, 
And they became culture vultures, and they brought their bicycles into town, they sold their cars. So I think, uh, you know, for those of us, I think we think of ourselves as middle-aged, you know, it's a new beginning in the city if you want to move in. So I think the city has to uh, provide those kinds of opportunities for the boomers. And to that point, not, not merely in the fancy developed, you know, waterfront loft neighborhoods, but, uh, you know, Ruth had been talking earlier about the fact that we can really see this population as a gentrifying class. So one of the things that researchers have seen is that, in fact, older adults cost cities less than families with children. Now, that doesn't mean they cost government less. Part of this has to do with the idiosyncrasies of who pays for what. Right. But in cities that pay for schools and roads, principally, older adults don't need to have a world-class public school system in order to consider living in a community and don't necessarily want to be living in a community so that they can be driving everywhere. And so one of the interesting observations that people have made is that people, um, older adults can be part of the artists and the gays, so we can have the artists and the gays and the old um, as the first people into neighborhoods. I guess we gotta have a coffee shop, uh, <laughs> uh, I learned uh, this morning, and that sounds right to me. <laughs> um, but uh, we can think about older adults in different ways as we start recognizing that aging is part of the life course and we all wanna do different things in it. Exactly. Um, so I think for everyone out there working in city government, the idea isn't to get a sitcom to come be filmed in your city. It's to just kick out all the 18-year-olds <laughs> and <laughs> bring in the over 60s. One, you know, let's talk about a huge issue, which is transportation. Um, exactly how older people navigate transportation and, and how we have to you know, how cities have to rethink their transportation systems to accommodate older people. I know that Lisbon, for example, uh, in Portugal, is uh, reassessing the risk of walkability throughout the city to create more walkable streets, um, and, and which is wonderful. We don't necessarily want older people, you know, there's a lot of debate in this country about should we revoke licenses at a certain age? Is, you know, uh, older people can be involved and, you know, drive way past, be able to drive way past the time that they should fatalities, all that, what cities are really doing a good job in thinking about this particular issue? Well, the transportation issue has multi-tiers and different cities are doing different things. The first thing to remember is that the most common mode of transportation is walking. And that's a really good thing, because um, walking's good for you, and because the worst thing about aging is isolation, and so walking is good for staying connected with your community, getting out and about. So right. there are cities that are focusing on walking and walkability, and that's really important. The next. Well, if I was going to say, if you're walking, the one thing a city can do for people who are walkers who get older is to provide places for them to sit down. Yes. And benches, uh, developing street furniture, uh, those are things that a city can plan to do. And uh, it's, it's interesting because our firm, my particular practice, deals with buildings that are designed for people to age in place and to get gradually older till they get very old and need, and need care. But we found that a lot of the things that are really good for seniors are good for families with young children and anybody with disabilities. So the things you can do for seniors help a, a larger section of the population. But I would just say one other thing, if you're planning, particularly urban planners, I mean, one of the things is that sometimes the urban planning solutions are in silos. For example, our last administration put in bike lanes, right. which really helped the cyclists, but it's terrified older citizens who don't have the, the speed or the reflexes to either see it coming. Many have been hit and injured. They don't think they can make it across the street if somebody's going 50 miles an hour on a bike, and they don't think they can make it to the middle island. So I think anybody in policy, you really have to talk across 
all, all the initiatives that you're doing to make sure that you know, the law of unintended consequences doesn't hurt a group of seniors, for example, even though it's helping the bikers. So I think those are, as you're, as you're thinking about transportation systems in general, those are good things. Which can be summed up by using an age and everything lens so that every decision that you make, both in the public sector and in the private sector, you need to sort of hold up a mirror and say, how does this work for people of all ages? And so that means, how does this work for families with young children? How does it work for children? How does it work for middle-aged people? And how does it work for older adults? And we have to pay particular attention to those groups that we exclude. And so I have to call out explicitly that communities of color and older communities of color are often not appropriately considered when we right. think about um, urban planning. But if you use an age and everything lens, then you can manage the idea of a bike lane, a pedestrian lane, and a crossing that gives people enough time to cross. And, and the bike lane issue is, is sort of two-sided because, again, people in their 60s and even early 70s might be triathletes in this, you know, time that we're living, and so many people might actually embrace right. the concept, right? Exactly. But they, you know, the bike lanes are just, are just one thing. The other th interesting thing about transportation is that if you have people who have been s suburbanites and become urbanites or get older, they may not want to go down into a subway even though it's available. Right. I think, uh, and the staircases yeah. might be difficult. Right. I mean, there are elevators and things like that, but I think there are also you know, vision issues and going into a darker place from from outside, and I think people have orientation issues when it comes to, to lighting. I mean, Uber, for, for better or worse, has made it actually easier for seniors because they can tell them exactly where they are, and they don't feel like they're, right. they're stranded somewhere. Uh, right. And again, Uber may not be for everybody, but I think for, for boomers and aging boomers and, and people who are still active, you know, that's another form of transportation that's become available you know, very recently. It's a, it's a recent change, but, and it helps not only you know, older people, it helps, uh, you know, millennials who are working till 12 at night and don't want to walk the streets themselves. Exactly. So again, it's, it's, it, it helps everybody. And also, older people who are drivers at Uber also. Right, and right, also. again, it, um, Ruth, I wanted to talk a little bit about cities we can really learn from abroad, and you uh, have some thoughts about Manchester and England and Barcelona who are doing really innovative uh, work in accommodating this population. Mm -hmm. Manchester is one of my favorite places because they have a really integrated model of co-design that they've implemented from the beginning. And it sort of goes top to bottom. Um, city government is directly involved at the local level, as are older adults, and not just older adults that are organized into senior centers, but older adults in, in communities. And they've identified and set their priorities based on what people have told them. So they've redesigned some parks. They have a whole big safe sex campaign out because they uh, learned that they needed that. Um, they developed a dating scene and wow. app because there was a big desire for that at the same time that they put some natural barriers um, into back alleys because people were um, threatened through their back door. So it sort of runs a gamut um, across the sort of need spectrum. Right. Um, There's also, I mean, in, uh, the Scandinavian countries are way ahead of us in terms of integrating. Oh, it comes back to Scandinavia at these well, conferences. Well, can I say, <laughs> I mean, for the people who brought you IKEA, they, uh, in, in Denmark, a lot of the senior housing, uh, particularly for older seniors who need a little bit of uh, health assistance, oftentimes there'll be planned where it'll be an apartment building that's built over a supermarket. And part of the activities of the day are to go down the elevator and go into the supermarket. You don't have to go outside. You don't have to take a bus. So uh, it's, I mean, it's socialism in action, I guess, like, which is maybe a bad word during our election cycle here. But um, it's... Uh, it's, it's a lot of interesting planning that they don't separate seniors out. I think one of the problems that we've had is that uh, in the past 20 years... Uh, I happened because all I could do is think of it. Um, but, there, but people are developing, using technology, ways to augment the naturalness of neighbors coming together. 
I'd like to open, uh, open this up for questions. Anybody? Yes, sir, in the back. To follow up on uh, Art Magazine, uh, I think maybe somebody in this room or on the panel can uh, probably substantiate the fact that Bob Dylan's cover story interview was the best read pages <laughs> that publication has ever put out. <laughs> and that just tells us something about where people's heads are at this point. So yeah. there you are. <laughs> right. Or who's still reading. <laughs> Allison. So you talked about um, retirement communities being more remote and suburban and isolated. And I'm wondering, uh, my father's still working as a physician, nearly 80. It's sort of approaching retirement. I would have to drag him kicking and screaming to the existing <laughs> retirement right. options. Right. The NORC is not in the immediate future. Uh, are you seeing any more to use an overused word, innovative approaches that don't go to that kind of conventional over 55 community that, that's not right for a lot of people like him? Well, I think we're working on a project now in Riverdale, which hopefully will provide over 300 apartments for people who've been used to living in the city, want to be near eventual you know, healthcare options, but still are very independent and so sort of living in the city. And, and it will have access. It's right near a train line. You know, there'll be shuttles to various things, uh, as well as the usual things that people do on their own. They'll, go to, they'll have simulcasts of theater and concerts and things like that. Uh, I think we're trying to find, uh, one of the problems with New York as a place is that real estate is so expensive and every time you want to develop sort of a small scale senior community, you're outbid by condo developers and just the, the land costs are, are difficult. But I think we're, we're as a firm and as a, and as a profession dealing with seniors, we're, looking, we're trying to find ways to insert 50 to 100 apartments in the heart of an urban neighborhood. And so you don't have to build one of these sort of spaceship communities that has a gym and, you know, and, and a movie theater and dining options. The city is all your amenity that you need. It, it, the same thing you would do if you lived on your own. So I think you're going to see more of that if it can be done. And I think in the, in, in the past decades, Developers have said, well, they can't build less than 300 units. And I think now people are looking at 50 to 75 small insertions in neighborhoods that can benefit from the, you know, from the amenities of a city. So maybe there's, there'll be a place for your dad. And, and there's also I th probably things we could do reconceiving home sharing. I mean, the Golden Girls model, <laughs> the Golden Girls model, but, you know, not in Florida, but in the Back Bay in Boston. I mean, you know, we, we don't tend to do that culturally here, at least. Well... That's the good thing about we're boomers, <laughs> um, is that we have a history of um, many alternative ways of living. Communal living, and exactly. And we may take some of that forward. Um, but having said that, I need to re-emphasize that this isn't just about boomers. This is the new reality. Um, the world's... Um, population composition is changing and changing for good. Um, so people are living longer and fertility rates are dropping right. all over the world. And so we have lots of time to figure <laughs> this out because we have from now on to figure this out. <laughs> the, world is, the world isn't ever gonna be the way it was and in this case, our first guess wasn't our best guess. So the idea of let's build a parallel universe for old people is clearly not the way, not the way to go. We instead are gonna to have to think about the regular world that we're all living in, working for all of us. Other questions, yes. I'm sorry, could you wait for the, thanks. With an eye toward better aligning need and supply in cities, what in your opinion are some of the more promising levers for bringing together teachers, meaning baby boomers, natural teachers, with this surplus, at, well, that's a pejorative term, but this unimaginable wealth of um, uh, youth with 
potential in public housing complexes, for example, what do you think are some of the most promising tools to bring this need and supply together that are so great, uniquely great compatible? Question. Terrific question. Well, I think we need Roz back up here because <laughs> yeah. um, she'll design it better than I will. But there have actually been some um, pretty well evaluated programs that do just that. Um, I think the models of co-locating uh, where older adults are and schools is promising. Everybody knows about this new trend of people moving back to campus, which I think is um, probably wonderful and trying to reclaim a phase of life that I don't, you know, I don't know. But, um, but, but yet there can be interaction with those students in that kind of setting. And I think that settlement houses um, are a perfect place that we need to replace in our mind the idea of age segregated um, educational and social service institutions with age integrated ones so that those interactions become much more normal. Right, to, to add on to what Ruth is saying, I mean, we've, we've worked with a gr groups of retired professors who want to have us build them a community adjacent to the campuses where they've been teaching for 30 years and they want to be active, they want to still be in touch with their graduate students, they want to still be mentors. So those are self-initiated. Um, but say you take someone like Columbia University, who may be one of the biggest landholders in that part of the city, they also have a, a school of education. They could develop housing that would be age qualified, that could then work with the school of edu elementary education. And, and it's those kinds, I think you have to sort of look at creative alliances these days for people who have the access to the land and the capital to do this little bit of social engineering to get the older people closer to the campus so they can be a resource uh, particularly, you know, people who you know have just retired in a year but still have a lot to give, and and they want to do that. So that I think that's an that's an option that should be looked at. Fantastic. Thank you. We're out of time. I'm sorry, but this was a wonderful panel. Thank you for illuminating us. Thank you.